Good morning. morning. Welcome home to Centenary United Methodist Church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's so good to see you today. And greetings to those who are following us online today as well. Please silence your cell phone as we begin our service. Uh, I would tell you to read all the announcements in your bulletin, but there aren't very many, so that, that you can probably take about a minute to do that if you haven't already done so. Remember the white response cards, and people are using those. One side has a price, uh, place for prayer requests, those go in the offering plates later in the service. The other side has a place to ask for information about our church. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, and we do have some first-time guests today, so it's good to have you with us today. We're glad to have you. Um, and then there will be a Stephen minister or two uh, at the altar of the church at the conclusion of the service to talk with you or pray with you if you would like to do that. I don't have any other announcements this morning, but we do have a mission moment today. And Betty is going to bring a mission moment to us. So if you could step up over there to the microphone at the pulpit and... Good morning. My name is Betty Morris, and I want to take this moment for mission to update everyone on what is happening at Habitat for Humanity. First, y'all may remember the Faith Build House 2007 Pearson Street closed in January of this year. It's nice to know what happened. Uh, you may recall that Centenary gave $25,000 towards this build. Marie Brown is the homeowner, and she has now been in her home six months. Marie went through the process to become a Habitat homeowner. She had to apply and get approved to become a homeowner. Uh, she enjoyed what went, she was overjoyed when she met the requirements. She did the sweat equity with joy. Sweat equity means she had to work. She had to work on her home. Maybe she worked at the ReStore. Maybe she worked on somebody else's home. Uh, she loved working on the home because she learned some valuable skills in taking care of her own home. She also learned the financial responsibility of her home. And, and maybe some of you have volunteered to work on that home, uh, or maybe another home. But it took over 1,600 volunteer hours to build that home. Marie indicated that once they were able to move in, the first thing they did was sleep. <laughs> Imagine her family could finally relax. They have met their goal and it would be a stable life for she and her family from now on. Marie also mentioned she enjoys making her payment every month because she is paying for her home. Second, three homes are in process of being built. These homes are also in the Pembroke neighborhood. All are on Acock Street. The home at 1707 Acock will close in August, and the homeowner, Cassandra Everett, has worked hard to meet all the requirements. Two homes are side by side. One's a little smaller, one's a little bigger. It's 1701 and 1703, also on ACOC. Having homes side by side does help with getting volunteers and also the workload. Maybe if they're doing something on one house, they can also do it on the other. And, and save some money and, and be more economical. The homeowners are working hard to fulfill their requirements. The mission committee, Centenary, continues to support Habitat for Humanity financially. Centenary helped with Collegiate Challenge with students that came on their spring break and volunteered their time and talents. This way uh, they can help by volunteering. It, it takes many volunteers, as I've mentioned, to build a home. The sh shortage of affordable housing is a real problem in our community. Habitat currently has many qualified candidates. It just takes time to build the homes, but volunteers make a big difference in this whole process. Please
please keep loving your neighbor by supporting Habitat for Humanity because everyone deserves a decent place to live. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, very much. And thank you, brothers and sisters in Christ at Centenary, for your continuing support of Habitat. And now, friends, let us open our hearts, our minds, and our lives to the loving guidance of God. Please stand as we join together for our call to worship, which can be found in our bulletins. God has gathered us to this place. God summons us to this place. God will send us from this place. Please turn in our hymnals to page 540 as we sing together, I love thy kingdom, Lord. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid, the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test that sort of work 
each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. The Holy Gospel this morning is from Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make rests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the goods into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. A parable is like a joke. You either get it or you don't. If it has to be explained to you, it loses its impact, if not its meaning. You ever had that happen to you? You didn't get the joke, and when somebody explained it to you, it still wasn't funny because now it's not a joke anymore. It's an explanation. <laughs> That's the way it is in parables. Jesus rarely explained them. He taught them, and he expected you, even if you didn't get it, to think about it and think about it. And then he knew what would happen was eventually it would come to you all of a sudden, and you would get it. He taught in parables, and the thing he most often taught about was the kingdom of God, or as Matthew always says it, the kingdom of heaven, because as a good Jew, Matthew did not want to say the name God. So it's the same thing, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Matthew says Jesus' teaching is intended to show people how they might enter the kingdom. He says that the miracles prove that the kingdom has truly come in Jesus. At the heart of the Lord's prayer are the words, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The view of the kingdom of God that most Jews believed at the time of Jesus included a restoration of Israel to worldly power, like it enjoyed during the reign of Kings David and Solomon. Prosperity, power, respect. 
They believed this would happen when God intervened in history through the Messiah or anointed one. In other words, they believed the kingdom would be a return to the good old days when Israel was prosperous and strong and held in high esteem around the world. But of course, we know what happened with Jesus, don't we? He was crucified. And that hoped for earthly kingdom did not happen. Israel was not restored to power. In fact, only 40 years after Jesus' death, Jerusalem was burned, the temple was destroyed, and the Jews were scattered all over the world. And so even now, 2,000 years later, those Jewish hopes for a restored worldly kingdom are still unfulfilled. So they're unwilling to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Now, was Jesus wrong about his identity and mission? Was he wrong about being the Messiah? Well, of course, Christians don't think so. We believe his resurrection vindicated him. Therefore, he couldn't have been talking merely about an earthly kingdom. He made it clear throughout his ministry that the actual kingdom of God is not what people expect. But the disciples never got this until after Jesus was raised from the dead. Even though he said clearly in John 18, a verse that everybody since then has wanted to ignore, he said, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. It's not a worldly kingdom. It's not a political structure. The kingdom of God is a phrase that many people know but few people understand. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that the kingdom is invisible to most people. He said that to understand or experience the kingdom of God, you have to be renewed from within by God's spirit. You have to be born again or born from above, in other words, or you simply won't be able to perceive it. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he focused not just on earthly blessings, but on how people can enter the kingdom and live in it as citizens. This was also the teaching of Jesus' first and greatest interpreter, the Apostle Paul, who wrote in Romans 14, For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We enter the kingdom of God when we acknowledge God's existence and God's authority, and we seek to live in a way that represents God's character and will. And we Christians believe that that has been perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. We enter the kingdom of God when we acknowledge God's existence and authority, and then we seek to live in a way, the way of Jesus, a way that represents God's character and will. And the kingdom is relevant to us, not merely because it's our future reward, which it is, but also because it defines how we think and live right now. Now, how do the citizens of the kingdom of God live right now? I explained this a couple of weeks ago. I said that we obey the great commandment to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is how we live the kingdom of God now. I said that we obey the new commandment that Jesus gave to love one another as Jesus has loved us unconditionally and sacrificially. That's how we live the kingdom of God now. And I said finally that we obey the great commission to go and make disciples, to make new citizens of the kingdom, from all nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything Jesus taught. This is how we live the kingdom. When we trust God and seek to obey God, then we're able to live a different kind of life characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. A citizen of the kingdom will exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how you can tell if a person has entered the kingdom of God. Jesus calls a life full of those qualities an abundant life. And Jesus promises that anybody who lives that way right now in this world will continue to enjoy God's blessings in the life to come. Abundant life will transform into eternal life, in other words. So the kingdom of God is a community of people who not only believe all these things, but more importantly, they live them on a daily basis. The kingdom of God includes the church, but it extends far beyond it. It's not the same thing as the church. The church is inside the kingdom of God, which is much larger. Think of the kingdom of God as a sunny day, and the church is a window through which we can enjoy the light and beauty. The kingdom of God is a sunny day, and the church is a window through which we can enjoy that. In the Gospels, Jesus describes the kingdom 
with his parables. Two weeks ago, I talked about the parable of the sower and the seed. Last week, I talked about the wheat and the weeds. Matthew 13 is the chapter in which we find those, and it's the chapter in which we find other parables of the kingdom. So today, I want to talk about those other parables that tell us even more about the kingdom. In the parable of the mustard seed, we hear that a seed that is so small that we can barely see it like a speck of dust hides within it something significant. And in time, that tiny seed will become a plant so large that even the birds of the air will nest within it. Now, this is where it's good to dig in and find out what Scripture means. Birds of the air is a metaphor. He's telling a story about a bush and a seed and birds, but the birds of the air was a metaphor for the Gentiles, the people in this world who are not Jewish. So what he's saying is, is that the kingdom of God isn't just for the Jews, it's for everybody. Notice he never says the kingdom is not for the Jews also. I have brothers and sisters in the Christian faith that believe that Jews are excluded from the kingdom. Jesus never says that. Everybody listening to Jesus that day was a Jew. They already knew that the kingdom of God included them. But the idea that it was also for the Gentiles was a radical concept. And it was pretty unwelcome to the Jewish leadership who believed that God had only favored the Jews. And then Jesus moves on to the parable of the yeast in which a tiny flake of yeast worked into the dough causes it to rise and results in delicious bread. Do you see the similarity between those two stories? Something small and insignificant in each one leads to something much bigger and better. He's trying to tell us something about the kingdom of God. Now, parables don't just have to mean one thing. They can speak to us in different ways at different times in different situations. For today, let's say that the seed and the yeast remind us of the kingdom of God. Since the kingdom is not about worldly power, to many people it seems irrelevant. It's more or less invisible. You might even say it's hidden to the world like a tiny seed or a flake of yeast. But as our love for God grows, as our love for each other changes us, as we express this love in the world through good deeds of compassion and justice, then the world around us begins to change. And thus, the kingdom of God that is for all people works its way through the world like yeast and flour until something wonderful and unexpected happens. And by by the way, every detail matters. The three measures of flour that are mentioned in the parable, that's 60 pounds of flour. How much bread is that going to make? People listening would have understood, like the parable of the sower where the farmer is throwing seed everywhere. He doesn't care what happens, he's just going to throw all the seed. We're once again giving an image of God's incredible generosity and abundance. Next comes the parable of the hidden treasure. A man finds a bag of gold hidden in a field. Now by now we have a fairly good idea of what to expect with these stories. Something has been hidden and that something stands for the kingdom of God. The man sells everything that he owns so that he can have the field and the treasure buried in the field. Now, of course, that story would have shocked Jesus' audience. Number one, they would have thought it was stupid. It's stupid to sell everything that you have because you think there's treasure in a field. I mean, every day we, we kind of criticize people that do that, right? We say that's a crazy risk. You're taking a, a, a risk with your, with your money, with your life that you shouldn't take. You can't eat treasure after all, can you? <laughs> You can't live inside treasure. And yet this man risks everything for something hidden that is of immeasurable value. He extravagantly risks everything to get the treasure, the kingdom of God, to acquire that way, that new way of life that will change everything. Do you understand yet, friends, where Jesus is going with this? Do you have ears to hear and eyes to see? And then comes the parable of the pearl. In Jewish tradition, the pearl represents devotion to God and spiritual wisdom. It had a specific meaning. It stood for kind of a spiritual illumination that everybody wanted to have. In this story, the pearl is so valuable that it's worth everything to the one who finds it. And like the man in the previous story, this merchant sells everything to get the pearl of great price. And when he gets it, guess what? 
He's no longer a merchant because he sold everything that he had to get to sell to get the pearl. Now he's something else. This thing of great value has transformed his life. So the kingdom of God is insignificant from a worldly perspective. It's not going to make you rich and famous. The kingdom of God is not going to win you a handsome or beautiful lover. In modern terms, we would say that it is impractical and irrelevant, which is why the world doesn't pay any attention to it. It seems so unimportant that it might as well be buried or hidden. That's what Jesus is saying. But the kingdom of God, the way of life that Jesus has invited us all to accept, is actually the most valuable thing of all. It is worth trading everything else for. We're almost done. Finally, there is the parable of the net. A fisherman casts his net and hauls in a load of fish. And then he sorts them into two piles, one to keep and one to throw back in the water because they're no good. And in this story, Jesus makes his meaning explicit. A time of reckoning is coming, according to him, when evil is going to be dealt with once and for all. It's the same imagery that Jesus used in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, isn't it? Same idea, bundling the wheat and the tares up. He ties the kingdom of God that is already in the world to the kingdom of God that is yet to come. Now, folks, this stuff about kingdom, the kingdom of God, is not just some kind of intellectual exercise. It's not just book learning stuff. It's the very heart of Jesus' teaching. And yet somehow we've lost it, haven't we? We don't talk about it that much. Somewhere along the way, we were all sold a bill of goods that salvation is only about going to heaven when you die. That's all it is. It's an insurance, a fire insurance policy. Say the sinner's prayer and you'll go to heaven. You're done. You've taken, you've taken care of everything now. You can go to church occasionally if you want to. Put a little money in the plate. But you're good to go now because you have said the prayer. That's what the kingdom of heaven is about. That's a bill of goods. That's plain wrong. Life after death, folks, is just the gravy. Living and loving and learning the kingdom of God every day is the steak and potatoes, at least according to Jesus. Now let's talk about those scary words of judgment. They're very similar to the words that he used in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, and I said I would come back to them, and I'm going to today. At the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is harsh stuff if we take it literally, isn't it? And I explained why last week. Every one of us is a mixture of good and evil to some degree. None of us are perfectly good and none of us are totally evil. Tyler mentioned a quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the great Russian writer. He said the, the dividing line between good and evil, it's not on the ground between you and me. It's not in between the Democrats and Republicans or the United Methodists and the Global Methodists, the line between good and evil runs right through the center of every heart. So this is a harsh saying if we accept that we are all a mixture of good and evil. People are capable of both incredible goodness and compassion, and we're also capable of unimaginable cold-blooded cruelty. And since none of us are perfect, destruction by fire as a way of dealing with it seems very harsh. Never-ending torture seems very out of character for Jesus, doesn't it? But I believe we misunderstand and misuse these kinds of words in the Bible. Given that the parables use so many figures of speech, sower, seed, soil, mustard seed and shrub and birds, yeast and dough, a hidden treasure, a priceless pearl, nets and fish, they're all metaphors, aren't they? then why do we take the furnace and the fire literally? All of this is symbolic until we get to the furnace and the fire and then we want to say, oh no, that's literally true. That part's going to happen exactly like it says. Is it not more likely that they too are metaphors? Images that are meant to affect us at a subconscious level, like a poem or a piece of music. They're meant to work like parables. They get inside us and they do their work. That's how parables work. That's why Jesus told them. Jesus knew he could not get through to us unless he bypassed our rational mind and all its filters and prejudices. He's got to get a story in deeper than that so that it can start to work on you. A parable goes straight for the heart. That's why Jesus was so reluctant to interpret them to people. You either get them or you don't. So what then does a fiery furnace stand for if it's a metaphor? 
We already know the answer to this question because the Bible tells us. Psalm 12, 6. The promises of the Lord are promises that are pure silver, refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Proverbs 17, 3. The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Isaiah 48, 10. See, I have refined you, but not like silver. I have tested you in the furnace of adversity. Isn't it interesting? We don't want to take those literally, do we? But we want to take these other words literally. In these verses, fire does not punish. Fire does not destroy. What does it do? It purifies. It refines. Think about the story of Daniel in the fiery furnace from the book of Daniel. The prophet Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fire by the Babylonians to execute them for staying loyal to the God of Israel. But instead of burning them up, they were miraculously delivered. And the Babylonian king then honored their God from that moment forward. So in Scripture, furnaces do not always incinerate and destroy, do they? Sometimes they miraculously transform. That's how the prophet Malachi puts it when he talks about the day of judgment. The same day that Jesus is referring to in his discussion about fire. It's the same day, the day of judgment, the last day. Malachi says, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap, which is bleach, by the way. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Fire as purification. And lo and behold, this is also what Paul says in our passage from 1 Corinthians 3. It's almost like he's read these other passages of Scripture. Just like Malachi and Jesus, Paul is also talking about the day of judgment. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each one will become visible for the day of judgment will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Paul says that we who are a mixture of good and evil are not going to be incinerated like trash in an incinerator, but we're going to be cleansed like a corroded piece of gold in a refiner's fire. The fiery furnace is Jesus' way of talking about God's ultimate way of dealing with the evil in the world and the evil within each soul by apply, applying the blazing inferno of his perfect and holy love to everything in this world that is opposed to it, to everything that is in us that is opposed to it, God melts away all the flaws and imperfections until all that remains, no matter how little is left, is acceptable to God. Now you may say, Pastor, this refining fire Paul speaks of is only for the church. People who aren't in Christ aren't going to be purified by the fire. They're going to be destroyed by it. But I wouldn't be so sure about that. Scripture does not draw as clear a distinction between the church and the world as you might think. Listen to Paul in Romans 2. And Paul is talking to us, by the way, Christians. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the same things. There will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. The Jew first. And for Paul, remember, the Jews were the people of God. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day of judgment according to when my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. Remember that dividing line is not between Jews and Gentiles or Christians and non-Christians. That dividing line runs through every heart. So Paul is saying to us, don't get too comfortable, believers, just because you consider yourself saved. Even those who follow Jesus Christ are going to feel the holy fire of God's perfect grace. 
not because he hates us, but because he loves us so much that he wants the same purity for us that he gave his own son. Just don't get too comfortable with your sin because fire still burns, even if it's doing you good. When our final remaining imperfections are cleansed away by God's grace, we are going to weep in sorrow <clears throat> because we will know then that we kept doing wrong and dishonoring God even when we knew better. It's going to be the tears of regret. We're going to grind our teeth in anger for wasting our precious time with trivial earthly things that kept us from fully enjoying the abundant life God intends for us. Just imagine at the end if you had to stand in front of God and God said, let me tell you how many hours you spent watching television. You had about 70 years to live and this is how many years you spent watching television. And you can't undo it at that point, folks. And when God's refining fire has finished its work, only the good in us will remain. That image of God in which we were created will be polished smooth of all defects. And we will, as Jesus says in his explanation of the parable of the sower, when that day comes, we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Jesus had to include these warnings about judgment and purification not to literally scare the hell out of us, and I mean literally to get it out of us, but because he loves us. He knows that the process of spiritual maturity is going to be hard and unpleasant, and he doesn't want us to have to go through any more pain than is absolutely necessary, which is why he warns us with such strong imagery. The parables of the kingdom are intended to reassure, reassure us and encourage us. In them, we hear the good news that in Jesus of Nazareth, through the Holy Spirit, God's reign has come into the world. And through those who believe, the kingdom of God changes the world bit by bit, two steps forward and one step back, until that last day when God finally decides he has done all he is going to do. And that day may be soon or it may be far off. Only God knows. Until then, things may sometimes be rough for the citizens of the kingdom of God. We have no guarantees, fellow Christians, that our lives are going to be any easier because we're Christians. In fact, in many ways, they're going to be harder, aren't they? Which is exactly what we are warned of in Scripture. The world is going to press in on us and sow despair in our hearts. The world may even kill us. That happens too. And because it can be so hard to perceive the kingdom, some days we're going to wonder if it's real at all. But like a mustard seed hidden and nearly invisible to the eye, God's kingdom will grow into a massive tree shading the entire earth. Like a little dab of yeast, it's going to leaven the loaf of life until the aroma of God's heavenly bread can no longer be denied by anybody. So we need not doubt or despair. And there's no reason for us ever to give up. Because Jesus, the teller of tales, Jesus, the one who loves us, is always with us. He will never forsake us, even when we feel as small and insignificant as a mustard seed or a flake of yeast. No matter how bad things may seem, friends, a day is coming when all shall be well and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, forever and ever in a kingdom without end. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, for us, the citizens of God's kingdom. Blessed be his name. Amen and amen. Our hymn is number 583, and let me tell you a little word about this one. We haven't sung this one before, and they didn't arrange it particularly well in the hymnal like some. I guess they didn't have the space. But you sing the verses, and then the refrain is at the bottom of page 583. You see the refrain, and you can sing it in Spanish if you'd like. I think most of you will probably prefer English. The refrain is, go, my friends, go to the world, proclaiming resurrection. I'm, where am I? I'm missing it. Okay, proclaiming love to all, messengers of my forgiving peace. Be my friends, a loyal witness, from the dead I arose, Lord, I'll be with you forever. You sing that at the end of each verse, and that includes verses 2 and 3, which are over here. So when you get to the bottom of verse 2, go over and do the refrain. Does that make sense, Tim? Is that how we do it?
Okay, like I said, they didn't lay it out very well because they didn't want to take an extra page, but that's what we've got. 583, I picked it. It's you are the seed. What do you know? <laughs> 583, let me invite you to stand and attempt to sing it.
declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. And now Pastor Carol is going to take over as I move on to my next appointment. God bless you all. Have a great day. Good morning. <laughs> so we've come to that time of our service where we indeed share our joys and our concerns with one another. Are there joys that we would like to lift up today? We did a wonderful song, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, time of praise, right, with that last hymn. So that was wonderful. He powered through. <laughs> oh, come on. Somebody must have a joy. There you go. That is indeed a wonderful <coughs> praise. Thank you. We're glad that you found a home here. Amen? Amen. Did you all hear her express her gratitude? And, and I think love for us, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So we're thankful to hear that this morning. Are we not, church? Mm-hmm. We're thankful for being in this Yes. <laughs> I think that might be me here. Let's <coughs> let's move this <laughs> down here. There you go. Ah, yes, thank you. Yes. Are there concerns you'd like to lift up this morning? Well, then I have some concerns that we need to folks that we all need to be in prayer for. Amen. So Charles Sykes and Paul. Yeah, the whole family, uh, Don Midget, uh, Cheryl Moore, Colleen Doucette, others who are recovering from surgery or facing surgery and other procedures, all those in need of healing, all those at home for whatever reason who cannot be with us, and those in rehab, nursing homes, care facilities, facilities, those grieving loss, and I would include our military, those who are serving both here and abroad. We want to be in prayer for our church, our pastors, our superintendents, our Bishop Shelton. Do we have others we'd like to add or lift up this morning? All right. And then let us bow our heads for the prayer this morning. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life, for the gift of your Son, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lead us through the trials, the suffering, and the sorrow, the challenges and struggles, and the tired times and dark places. 
for those who suffer from any illness or injury of mind, body, or spirit. Restore me and all those we carry in our hearts to the fullness of health is only you, O oh God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing mercy and love. May your love be like a seed, taking root and growing strong. Lead us with grace, love, and peace. Fill us with hope, patience, and strength. Transform us to grow, to understand, to see the world as you see it. Transform us so that we can be made whole. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and heart of Christ. These things we ask through Christ our Lord, praying together as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have come to that time, <laughs> special time of our hymn sing. So is there somebody that would like to uh, suggest the very first hymn that they would like to hear this morning? 707. 707. Okay, first and last. Second him.
other one that was shared earlier? Which? Uh, 593. Five, thank you. 593. <laughs> <laughs> the tiniest of seeds and wonder what will happen. From that small seed will grow a large shrub. Although we consider our gifts to be small and insignificant, God will use our gifts in miraculous ways. May we offer the best of ourselves and our blessings as a gift to you. Amen. And now let us uh, all rise. Oh, we're singing. You're singing. Excuse me. That's C. I did not make a note of that.
has said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. O oh God, we return your gifts to you. Multiply them, use them for your kingdom, and by your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other in ministry to all the world. Amen. And now, let us pass the peace of Christ to each other. <laughs> Let us all turn in our hymnals to page 356 as we sing together when we are living, and we're going to sing the first two verses. Yeah, so first two. now the benediction. You all have some faith. May God help you to trust him more confidently. You have some tenderness. May Christ help you to love more freely and fiercely. You all have some happiness. May the Spirit help you to smile and laugh more easily. As the precious children of God, go in peace to joyfully love and serve. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.